Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Hi, welcome to this talk. My name is Erica Johnson. I'm a professor of gender and society at Linköping University in Sweden. And I'm going to be talking about a, a book I wrote uh, recently called The Cultural Biography of the Prostate, and uh, also about an interdisciplinary study that I've been leading for the past five or six years on the prostate at Linköping University. This research is an example of uh, what we do at the Center for Medical Humanities and Bioethics, which is a newly started center that pulls together researchers from the medical humanity or medical faculty and the um, Faculty for Arts and Letters, where we try to create um, networks and um, collaborations across this faculty divide and uh, work around research with research, but also in terms of teaching and uh, also for outreach, trying to bring our research from both faculties together and then bring it out into the wider society. If you're interested in the work we're doing, contact me or our director, Christine Seiler at Linköping University. So this research, so if I stand here so you can see us all, it was part of a larger project called A Constant Torment, treat, uh, Tracing the Discourse of Contours of the Aging Prostate. This is the team I worked with on it. Uh, we were, there were nine of us. We were coming from different fields, from anthropology, sociology, gender studies, science and technology studies, sexology, and history. Most of us were based at Linköping University, though there was um, one of our colleagues was up at Uppsala University in Sweden, and our uh, sexologist, Karina, right behind me there, uh, was working at uh, Växjö Hosp uh, the Hospital in central Sweden. The reason I wanted to bring together this many different people with this many different backgrounds to approaching the, the prostate as a discursive node or a cultural object was because I wanted to be able to approach it from different angles with different theoretical lenses, but also with different methods and methodologies and allow us to use different types of data. So for example, the historians, not unexpectedly, used a lot of material found in archives, often at medical history libraries. Um, the anthropologists went out and observed what was happening in the field, either with doctors at the hospital or, uh, as Sonia did, following the blood from a PSA test into the lab and watching how it was producing knowledge about the prostate in the lab. Uh, the sociologists looked at organizational issues around how the prostate is treated, um, and some of us Actually, quite a few of us had a STS background or a science and technology studies background. So we were also interested in how the tools of um, medicine, the technologies of medicine, were also uh, entangled in the types of knowledge that was being produced about the prostate. And of course, because we were coming to this with some of, what of a um, critical studies lens and looking from a, a cultural studies perspective, we were also able to include in our work material from discourses at large, so films or jokes or how the prostate is talked about in advertising um, in society in general. Why did I get interested in the prostate? Prior to this project, I had been working on the way that Viagra changed Swedish masculinities and also the way Swedish masculinities and healthcare structures changed what Viagra was when it was introduced into Sweden. As I was doing that research, I started to see that Viagra was being prescribed to a lot of men with prostate issues. And as I was reading more and more about these prostate issues, read widely, um, I would come across phrases in the medical literature that really tweaked my interest. Sometimes I would hear the prostate described as a constant torment, or sometimes I would uh, read uh, medical doctors who presented with a patient who had diffuse pain in the lower regions or little uh, difficult to describe symptoms would say things like, in medical texts, it's probably the prostate that's haunting him. And I thought as a 
medical sociologist, what could be more interesting than a gland that haunts? What could be more interesting than something that becomes a constant torment in the body? A little terrifying, but extremely interesting from a medical sociology point of view and also from a point of view that looks at how we create knowledge about the body. And I started to wonder, what is the prostate? More than just, well, it's that little orange bit eh, underneath the bladder in that picture, but more, what do we mean when we're talking about the prostate? Um, when is it being used and to explain what? Because sometimes it was being used to explain things that were much more diffuse than simply pain or difficulties ur uh, urinating. It became something that it becomes, or it is, something that is often used to talk about things like masculinity, aging, sexuality, and the way our bodies change with time and uh, for different purposes. So I started to wonder about what the prostate was. I started to pull together this group of researchers that we were gonna go out and look at it. And I also started writing to various medical archives and medical history libraries in, in Europe to try to figure out when we started to think about the prostate for the first time. When did we start to know the prostate? How did we represent it before? And how do we know it now? What medical technologies help us to learn things about the prostate now? And I got a very interesting response from the Medical History Library in Zurich, which invited me down to their archive to look at what was their earliest representation of the prostate, um, which is this figure here uh, on the, oh, hard to point, but the one in the frame. Uh, and it's a painting, or it's a wax relief that was produced in the uh, late 1700s. So I went to the archive in Zurich and the archivist took me down into what was a huge room dug out of the mountainside, the seven stories down, uh, with those crank uh, rolling shelves. And she cranked open a couple of the shelves, we went in and she pulled down about four or five of these reliefs in frames and um, showed me them. And I, I was very fascinated because it's true that on them, you can actually see a part of the wax modeled underneath the, um, the bladder that does represent the prostate. And this hasn't always been there in our medical, um, uh, medical uh, images of the male genital region. So I was really fascinated talking with her about like when it was made, late 1700s, who maybe did it. Well, it was um, a particular a man, most likely, it was unsigned, but most likely a particular man in, um, in the sewage area. And he was probably making these types of models of the body for medical doctors to sell to medical doctors to put and hang on their walls, just like we today hang diplomas on our walls in a way of convincing those who come to our office that yes, we do know what we're talking about. As you can see, there's no names on this. It's, it's something that is not meant to be um, used in teaching probably, but it's just there as a decoration and a con confirmation of the person's expertise. But then the archivist said to me, Erica, come over here, follow with me. And uh, we went through the shelves to the sidewall. She opened up these metal uh, cupboard doors and pulled out a series of metal boxes. And as I lifted the lids of each of them, I saw different types of body parts in them. And that's what the other picture is from. They, um, in these boxes were little eyes. The next one had little ears. The next one had little arms, legs. There was even one box full of little teeny babies uh, made out of wax, made out of wood, made out of metal. Um, all of them carved or molded or shaped to be sold to people in the valleys of the um, of Switzerland that were then brought to the churches and the churches would have often on one of their side chapels a place where you could leave this votive with a prayer, light a candle, pay a little money and ask God to help uh, you with whatever was bothering that part of your body. And the reason she showed me this was because the little wax images in each of these boxes, according to her, were probably made by the same family of handcraftsmen that made the, um, the wax relief she had showed me earlier. 
And this is a way of, um, why am I telling you this? this? Well, this is the way of talking about how the materiality of representing the body has a genealogy, it has a history, it, and it also is a way of talking about the changes that have occurred between which social institutions we assign or ask to task with the responsibility of taking care of our physical health, taking care of how we are feeling and how healthy we can be. It's also an indication of a shift at some point in the 1700s where the craftsmen started to realize that there was a whole new industry of medical doctors who had an interest in using their skills of representing the body with waxworks for various commercial reasons. There was no box of little cross states. And one of the reasons for that, I would suspect, is that it is not so very easy to know exactly what a cross state looks like or even what it is. And even today, a lot of the ways that we know a cross state, if we want to think in a sort of theories of science type of way, are actually extrapolated from how we know urination. I have a couple listed here on the PowerPoint. There are things like the bothersome index, which is a series of questions that doctors uh, can use as a standard series of questions that doctors can use to, uh, to um, examine a patient and ask how bothersome their prostate issues are, which has a lot to do with how bothersome their urination patterns are or have become in the recent, future, recent past. There are things like the frequency volume chart, which it asks the patient to keep track of how much they're peeing and when over a 24 hour period or a 48 hour period. Um, and also to keep track of how much uh, liquid a patient is consuming. There are things like flow rate recordings that can make graphs sort of how, um, how what kind of stream a person has when they're, when they're urinating. But there's also, and this is why I put it on here in the slide, uh, the picture of the London, uh, London urban area for a tourist map with uh, information about where toilets are. And this is because the prostate often makes itself known to people having a prostate, the men having a prostate, by making it more difficult for them to pee. And it was one of the things that became very clear in the interviews I did with men who I self-identified as having prostate issues, that that group of men were very aware, suddenly, of where toilets were in their public um, area, uh, which cafes had good toilets, which bus rides were too long to be safe for them to take without needing to get off and go pay, pee, which um, which gas stations on their normal routes had good places to stop and take a leak. The men were very aware of how the public toilet infrastructure was built and how their body was able to work within that infrastructure or not work very well within that infrastructure. And this is something I take from the research and try to bring into our courses at Linship University on urban planning because I think it's really common for us to think about public toilet infrastructures and critiques of it as coming from groups of, that are traditionally othered, like women or bodies who need wheelchairs or trans bodies. All of that has had a huge impact on how we think about public toilet infrastructures. But to that category and from this research, I would also like to add that we need to think about our public toilet infrastructures also through the lens of men who have had prostate issues, because that's a fairly large group as well. And we need to start thinking about how we can plan our public toilet infrastructures to work for all of these different types of groups. The PSA. Uh, I couldn't do a whole research project on the prostate without dealing with the PSA test, of course. Um, and so I had a postdoc that was working on specifically that, two of them actually. One of them was following the PSA blood through the lab, like I mentioned earlier, and her work showed how the laboratory assistants and those working on the blood test exam um, yeah, analysis were actually quite aware of the patients and their patient, their subject backgrounds, their, their patient backgrounds as well as they were being turned into numbers and blood samples. They also had a postdoc who was looking at the way 
um, PSA screening became a debate in various countries. This postdoc was from Colombia. He was looking at the way that PSA screening and testing was being presented in Colombia, but he was also comparing it to how, for example, the um, cervical cancer testing or uh, pap smears are being presented and talked about in the UK and also in Sweden. And during the course of this project, there was a new decision from the Board of um, uh, Social Welfare in Sweden saying that they were affirming or reconfirming their initial decision that they would not be offering screening, PSA screening or prostate cancer screening with the PSA test to all men over a certain age in Sweden. And this caused quite a bit of controversy, which we followed, but which we, and especially this postdoc, Oscar, tried to analyze from a way, um, from a perspective or a theoretical lens that looked at the way PSA screening and medical screening in general produces a particular patient subjectivity, one that initiates a trajectory of care, or at least initiates a, subject, uh, a patient subject trajectory so that a person becomes a patient or a potentially ill patient throughout the course of the rest of their life by starting a screening regime, but also the way that that screening and that subjectivity creates vulnerabilities and creates feelings of being vulnerable. And we tried to, with this work, also raise the question of how the PSA screening and the way of knowing the, the prostate through repeated testing that it does um, imply, produces that vulnerability and that how that vulnerability is not necessarily something that needs to be borne by the individual patient themselves, though it often is, but could be something that we present as being relational, as something that is embedded in how we produce and respond to patients around us, within us, in our families, at the medical encounter, in, in various, various roles and positions. We also looked at the um, dreaded DRE, digital rectal exam, which is one of those exams uh, that allows you to actually feel the prostate or at least feel the contours of the prostate by inserting a finger through the rectum and feeling the prostate's backside primarily um, through the, the skin of the um, lower intestine, but is also one of these exams that ends up being the uh, butt, if you'll excuse the word, of Hollywood jokes, and it tends to be something that a lot of patients really dread and joke about out of discomfort, but also trying to avoid. Um, and so, I had in the project a, an anthropologist who had been previously working on studying how the bimanual pelvic exam, the gynecological exam, is taught to medical students at our university in Sweden, which is a pretty interesting program uh, that she had been following and, and um, shadowing that enrolls volunteers, often middle-aged women who have had a child or two and feel quite comfortable being with as a volunteer in this project to become in evening times and be a professional patient. That is, be a patient to let the medical students train on, training the gynecological exam on, and at the same time being an active teacher within that exam together with the gynecological teacher. Um, and as our anthropologist had watched them teaching this exam, she had noticed how much work went into explaining to the medical students that the woman on the, on the gynecological table was a, a person who probably thought this was a little uncomfortable, maybe a little bit embarrassing, uh, that the exam itself can be a bit uncomfortable, that uh, there are ways to approach the patient um, that are sensitive, and that are respectful and that are also aware of the fact that perhaps this patient has had a history of experiences with that part of their body that make the exam even more difficult and trying to create a bedside manner that acknowledges and allows for a sensitive patient and still gets the exam done correctly. The same gynecologist then within the prostate project followed um, urology students, medical students learning urology, as they learned to do the DRE. And what she saw was that there was a very different patient subjectivity being presented. 
In most of the cases, the students were not um, spoken with beforehand and, uh, about how to meet the patient, how to touch or speak with the patient, how to address the patient's um, insecurities, but rather were brought in uh, and asked to try to examine the patient and then talked about the specifics of the exam, what they might be seeing or feeling as they're doing the exam correctly. I mean, this is the important part of the exam, but what was happening was that during that patient encounter, the students were being taught to encounter a patient who was not sensitive, who was not bringing with them previous experiences that maybe would change how they responded to this exam, nor was this patient being allowed to present a subjectivity that would be imagined as vulnerable or sensitive. There was a discussion about how this patient was probably afraid of having prostate cancer. This appears again and again in all prostate work, but there was very little else about how the patient was um, a subject with a background and a history um, about that part of their body. So what her research tried to show, or what we try to show when we're talking about her research, is that the actual medical encounter and how the doctors are expecting the patient to behave and how the patients are expected to behave and expecting to behave themselves to just go in there and do it and get it over like a, with like a man, it pre also produces a particular type of patient subjectivity in that clinical encounter. At the same time as it produces knowledge about the prostate and how it feels. So it's doing two things at once there. Those are some of the ways to know the prostate. Of course, there are also other ways to know the prostate. And today, with the types of medical visualization technologies that we have available, there are many different ways of seeing the prostate, even while it's still in the body and that body is still alive. The one at the very top here is a um, ultrasound of the prostate. The darker one underneath it is an MRI of the prostate. The one just to my well, over there it is a laparoscopic um, image from laparoscopic surgery where they're cauterizing the prostate during a prostatectomy. Right above my head is a image of the prostate from an anatomy book or an, an anatomy post, a poster actually from the 1940s. There you can see the prostate is um, green just underneath the bladder, which is circled in orange. And the image furthest over there is a photograph from 1906 on a book from a book about the prostate of parts of one single prostate after it had been operated on and removed and then photographed. So a very early way of knowing the prostate. All of these different technologies produce very different images of the prostate. Also can lead to different understandings of what, what we see when we see the prostate how we imagine it, how we envision it, and how we can treat it and take care of it. But most of them use this understanding of the prostate as a collection of glands and muscle tissues surrounded in a sheath, surrounding the urethra at the base of the bladder. This is how we think of it now. And I went back to that picture of the wax relief, which had been modeled most likely on anatomical drawings that were circulating at the time in the 1700s and the 1600s in medical textbooks, anatomies as they were called, that were being published in, and which were uh, not this one, but were in wide circulation and were being used as a way of spreading knowledge about how the body looked like. Often these had been drawn from uh, live, not live dissection, but dissections that were performed in medical theaters. Um, is sometimes for a general public, often for medical schools. The one in the middle is Vesalius's famous um, anatomy book from 1543. And that's the first book where we actually see the prostate drawn. It's not labeled, it's not named, but it does appear as a little bump of something underneath the bladder, just like it does in that wax relief. The other, ah, there. The other uh, sketch there is, of course, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, famous, one of his famous sketches. Uh, this one was done uh, in the early 1500s. He missed the prostate. It's not there. 
So it wasn't until uh, 1560, uh, um, no, 1543, that we had it sketched and drawn by Vesalius. Then um, in the 1600s, it was named, though initially it was just named as the prostatea, which is Latin with a plural ending, because it was not quite sure if this was one gland or a collection of glands, um, at least two, maybe more. But by the mid-1700s, it was being called prostate in English and probably thought to be a singular gland. And that's basically how people imagined it as well in the 1800s, um, and to some extent even today. The historians on our project, Maria and Eamon, uh, they were looking at, among other things, how the prostate was being treated in primarily the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. Here I've got a couple of pictures from some of the um, research they did in archives uh, of different ways and tools that could be used to try to work on the prostate. A lot of these uh, techniques were not particularly successful, often quite painful, and because much of it was being done before antibiotics, had a very large uh, mortality rate. So uh, prostate surgery back at the end of the 1800s probably had a, a mortality rate of about 40%, and even those who survived were not necessarily successfully treated. Uh, one of the other options at the time was catheterization, which of course is an option today too, but catheter technologies were much more primitive at the time. They were very painful to use and also very hard to keep, keep clean. So most catheter patients would embark on what was called the catheter life with trepidation, and there was like an 8% death rate after just a month of that as well, because um, urinary tract infections were quite common and they could lead to death. Um, because of this, men who were suspected to have prostate problems were um, um, willing to try all sorts of different options. And one of the ideas that was being presented in the late 1880s was to castrate men and see if that would affect their prostate problems, particularly in enlarged prostates. Now, the reason, there are a couple of reasons why this was suggested. One was that they had noticed that um, uh, Enochs did not generally tend to develop prostate problems late in life. life. The, the castrati that were singing in operas, for example, almost never had that problem. Uh, also, dogs who had been castrated generally tended not to have prostate issues. And dogs are one of those species that can develop prostate problems late in, in life. But the main reason that this option was presented by the medical community in the late 1800s was because at the same time, there was an already established way of dealing with a benign tumor growth in the uterus for women, and that was to remove the ovaries. This was considered a good way of um, curing problems with the uterus. And there was a theory that the prostate was kind of homologous to the uh, uterus. So if it worked to remove the ovaries in the female body, then it might also work to remove the testicles in the male body. This was the theory and it was tried out. There were quite a few men who didn't really think this option was a good option, but there were quite a few men who agreed to have it done. And, and what they found was that it wasn't particularly successful in terms of reducing prostate uh, growth and Many of the men who had had this procedure done reported severe or moderate um, problems with their psyche afterwards, with their mood swings, with depression or melancholia, so it was called. Um, and so because the treatment started to impact the psyche of the men, the doctors agreed in the letters back and forth that has been analyzed for this part of the study that uh, no, uh, removing the testicles to cure the prostate was not a good solution, and they stopped doing it in surgically, at least. Um, however, what's really interesting from a theories of science point of view for this one is that this whole episode of trying a new cure to treat a prostate problem 
was based on using existing knowledge about the female body and transferring it over to the male body, which is very unusual as far as we can see in the history of, of medicine. Usually we, we think about the body as the male body or the male body as the universal body and knowledge about it being used, transferred over to working with um, and producing knowledge or at least theories about how the female body should work. The other thing that's really interesting about this is that the removal of the ovaries to reduce the um, growths in the uterus was also in parallel to a practice at the time of removing the ovaries to address uh, psychological problems for women. So by removing the ovaries, it was thought that they could cure psychological problems. However, in the male patients, what they ended up seeing and, and theorizing about was that the actual removing of the test testicles was producing the psychological problems afterwards. So there was a complete shift in how a person perceived where the causality was in this type of treatment. Like I say, this was historical. However, when we think about how there are treatments today for different um, prostate issues, there can be some parallels drawn. Not necessarily all, but some. Uh, some of the treatments for prostate problems today, and there are different types of prostate problems, I'm talking in, about prostate cancer, of course, but also in benign prostate hyperplasia and to some degree prostate but if we feel, or if the medical community feels that this prostate has gotten too large or is cancerous and needs to be removed, then often it's surgery, but there's also radiation. And then there are also pharmaceuticals that can be prescribed to treat these different things. And these different treatments have very different side effects, but some of the famous or infamous side effects for prostate treatments today are incontinence, impotence, and a loss of libido. And these are things these types of side effects are recurring discursive elements that we find in a lot of the literature and a lot of the cultural discussions around prostates and prostate problems and a lot of the fear about um, having prostate problems, but also maybe being that man with the prostate problems is its connection to things like incontinence and impotence and to some degree also a loss of libido. And it is here that we can see a lot of the parallels that are being drawn, or not, not the parallels that's being drawn, but a lot of the um, tangents that can be made to existing discussions about masculinity and sexuality and aging. And those are some of the things that we try to tease out in the material that we've been working with um, as well, to talk about how when we start to see discussions about the prostate, through the lens of masculinity studies or sexuality studies or in, in conversations about aging and these discussions about successful aging and it, then we can see the con concerns that the prostate is articulating or that conversations about the prostate are articulating in a much clearer way. So uh, just to recap, five ways of knowing the prostate that I've talked about today that do very different things. Uh, remember the slide about all of the different ways that we could measure how the prostate was affecting urination. You can measure how the measure the prostate or produce knowledge about the prostate by measuring its effect on the body and measuring how it changes how the body is being used. The PSA, the prostate specific antigen that is produced by the prostate and ends up in the blood and uh, which is then analyzed through the blood test, not only produces knowledge about the prostate, often in association with questions about whether or not there's prostate cancer, but also in association with questions about the size of the prostate, especially for suspected benign prostate hyperplasia, not only measures the amount of prostate-specific antigen, it also generates a care trajectory for the patient. And this we saw with um, conversations often informal with, for example, urologists who would whisper aside, you know, in an aside to me at a conference, like, you know what? I don't take the PSA tests because I don't want to start wandering down that to that slippery slope or that little path that's going to wind my way for the rest of my life through a series of numbers and more and more testings. Because it produces a trajectory and because it produces a patient subjectivity, a subjectivity of somebody who's potentially going to be diseased. So with the PSA, one way of knowing the prostate, but also doing much more than that. The DRE, 
uh, the digital rectal exam, produces knowledge about the prostate, how it feels, what sort of um, firmness or contours it has on its backside, but it also produces a patient's subjectivity there in the examining room, one that perhaps often mirrors or reproduces um, expectations about masculinity and the male approach to healthcare that perhaps it could be reevaluated. Then we had the visualization tools, what sorts of prostates they produce, what images of the prostates they produce, what aspects of the prostate they make visible and how the boundaries of the prostate are in relation to other parts of the body there. Uh, but also what types of treatments they make available. So for example, the visualization tools of the laparoscopic surgery and the way that it makes uh, people surgery uh, a, a way of treating prostate issues. And then finally, the historical work, which showed how knowledge about the prostate also relies on comparisons with other bodies, be those uh, the bodies of um, other men or the bodies of other types of uh, living creatures like dogs or the bodies of women and how this knowledge about other bodies can sometimes be transferred over to theories and explanations about the male body as well. Why do I bring up all these ways? Well, it's connected to the title of the book, A Cultural Biography of the Prostate, uh, which is meant to convey the feeling or the understanding that there are different ways of knowing what a prostate is, just like there are different ways of writing or knowing what a per who a person is. So when you're writing the biography of a person, uh, you often end up writing, or a biographer will often end up using sources from historical material, maybe from archives, from documentation from that person's professional life, but also interviews with that other people who have known that person in different contexts. And all of those different sources give a different understanding of that person, just like our use of various types of sources for this project, give a different understanding or a more nuanced understanding of the discursive contours of the actual prostate. And what is it? Depends on who you ask. What is it? Depends on how you do research on it. Uh, what is it? Well, it depends on what tools you're knowing to you're using to know it. Um, they all tell a different story. These sources they all produce a different con are produced in a different context and can produce a different type of prostate. And finally, the last slide. Uh, I just want to talk about the absent prostate because what became extremely clear in our material was that it is often when the prostate is removed or absent from the body, that it becomes most present for the individual who has or has had that prostate. It's even more present in its absence than it was before. This is in line with a lot of medical humanities research, especially phenomenology, which talks about how the silence of the healthy body is always mirrored through that black mirror by the loudness of the diseased body. And here we see that the men who were most aware of their prostates were the ones who had a prostate acting up or who had had a prostate and were now dealing with the side effects of the treatments that had been used to care for it and cure, with the, cure it. But more than that, this part of our research, which relied on uh, interviews that uh, Youngler and Karina did, where the Karina was the sexologist working at a urology clinic with a lot of men who had had prostectomies and or various other prostate treatments, um, sort of to show how diverse and heterogeneous that group of men is. That our understanding of post-prostectomy patients, it tends to focus perhaps on the diversity of how the body responds to different types of prostate treatments, but tends to sort of gloss over or bracket the category men. However, looking more closely at the data, it showed that there was a real benefit to opening up that category men. To do this, we drew from 30, 40 years of feminist critique of, of medicine, women's health movements, women's health activism that has critiqued the understanding of woman that is often embedded or, or female that is often embedded in medical treatments and said, look, you know, women are, are very, it's a very big group with lots of different people in it. And 
an intersectional approach that is aware of, for example, differences in age or class or race or geographical position, um, backgrounds in various ways, sexuality, including information on that or nuances that are aware of the power structures present producing in identities through these types of intersectional categories will help open up the category of woman and make the potential medical treatments um, adapt to that person, individual specific needs better. Using that understanding of women, we've turned it to this category of men, which is often what we think of when we do research on, on um, prostatectomy patients and try to see who is being missed in that category. Now, the easy one, of course, was realizing that in terms of, for example, sexual therapy for men after prostatectomy, there was an incredibly um, homogenous assumption uh, that all of these men would be engaging or wanted to be engaging in heterosexual penetrative sex. And we could find very little literature on how men who um, perhaps identify as homosexual respond to treatment and post-treatment um, therapies. So Karina uh, and uh, Yammer put together a study where they interviewed men who self-identify as homosexual, which is a difficult way of categorizing, but this is what they ended up being able to use and did interviews with those men and found that, of course, there, there were many in similarities between the, the standard patient that we imagine, but that there were also some differences. Some of this had to do with responses to dry ejaculation, for example, and the, um, the loss of, of ejaculate uh, at orgasm. Uh, some of it had to do with concerns about uh, anal sex, both receiving and also being able to penetrate because you need to have a different type of erection for vaginal penetration or anal penetration or um, other ways of dealing with an erection. And more to the point that maybe the category homosexual or heterosexual was less useful in this analysis than actually thinking about the myriad of different ways that men enjoy or hope to use their body when engaging with it sexually and engaging with other people sexually. And that uh, this type of engagement uh, could, this type of diversity could also be useful when discussing um, post-operative sex with all men, regardless of how they identify sexually uh, with their sexuality. So what do we want to say with that? Well, aside from the details, we wanted to say, look, the category of men is far too broad to be useful for this type of study. We need to start thinking about men uh, in the multiple. Whose prostate is it? It's a very specific question to each patient and we would like to encourage a recognition of the diversity within that category when thinking about um, patient, prostate patients. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.